Hey family, it's Carlos Watson back with another special episode. Now growing up, I was very close to my mom and dad. They were incredibly lively people. My mom admired lots of people in the world, but there were two members of Congress she loved. The first was a woman from Texas named Barbara Jordan. The other was our next guest, Congresswoman Maxine Waters of California. She thought she was smart, she thought she was lively, and she thought she was unafraid. I have no fear, I'm in this fight. Talk to me a little bit about your reflections on COVID. I am feeling extraordinarily uncomfortable. When I talk about the elimination of poverty, a lot of it has to do with the role that Wall Street has played in that. What does that say to you that that many of your fellow Americans said four more years uh, with the 45th commander in chief? Who is the most talented politician you've ever met? Okay, there are actually two. Wow. Congresswoman, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Good, good. Are you, uh, are you staying safe during this, feels like crazy time? We're all trying, you know, we're trying. It's, it's not easy because uh, there's so many ways that you can get infected with this virus and, you know, trying to not be in crowds, not being with the family, not being with friends. I mean, you know. Yeah, I do. You know. I do. I do. Well, I am so grateful for you joining me. Thank you for joining me on the show today. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I'm delighted. Congresswoman Maxine Waters is one of the most powerful women in American politics today. No one should be so big so important, so powerful, they can violate the rules of this house and the laws of this country without suffering the consequences. Auntie Maxine, as she's known, has been a fearless advocate for women, children, and people of color. I don't like the way he uh, mimicked and mocked a disabled man. I don't like the way he talked about women. We have some members of Congress who are intimidated. I have no fear. I'm in this fight. As far as I'm concerned, the Tea Party can go straight to hell. Tishiary. Reclaiming yeah. my time. Okay. Reclaiming Matter my of fact. time. In 2019, Congresswoman Waters made history as the first woman and first African-American chair of the powerful House Financial Services Committee. The Congresswoman has been responsible for some of the boldest legislation California has ever seen, including the elimination of police strip searches for nonviolent misdemeanors. Throughout her more than 40 years of public service, Congresswoman Waters has been on the cutting edge, tackling difficult and often controversial issues. Yes, I call for Trump's impeachment early. This is our country. Most recently, after losing her sister Velma to COVID-19, Congresswoman Waters became an outspoken voice about the disproportionate way that the virus has affected the black community. So talk to me a little bit about COVID. I hope you don't mind if I start there first, because I understand that, that not only have you thought about it from a policy perspective, but that it's touched you personally as well. Talk to me a little bit about your reflections on COVID at this point, now that we're eight, nine, 10 months into dealing with it. What I will try to do, which I have not really done very much of, is to express how exasperated I am uh, with COVID-19. Older people are taking uh, more care and they're paying attention and they're staying in, uh, but it's the younger ones that I'm worried about. I want black people, my people to keep your ass at home. You know, everyone's experiencing inconvenience uh, the difficulty of living with it uh, is not something that uh, one can get comfortable with. Uh, you know, wearing the mask, not being able to go to the restaurants now. In Los Angeles, they just closed down the outdoor restaurants. And we have a curfew. They want you, you off the street by 10 o'clock and on and on and on. And so personally, I am uh, feeling extraordinarily uncomfortable and unhappy uh, with the inconvenience of COVID and frightened as I watch people dying and knowing that I and all of us could die uh, and particularly those of us who are mature and are older age. We are very, very susceptible to the virus and God forbid people with pre-existing conditions and people are dying and the numbers are frightening. I know that you are on opposite side, opposite party from President Trump, but I also know that you've been in politics a long time and you've gotten to know people on different sides of the aisle. And so I imagine 
you have quiet conversations with people too. What does the president say and what does his team say? Because they must be losing loved ones as well. I mean, they must be losing friends and family members. There has to be fear there. Why do you think there's not been a more robust reaction? Well, you know, the most interesting thing about the followers of Trump is how long it took them to become believers. And when he discouraged wearing masks and talked about it really was not as serious, it was kind of like the flu, and that you could basically cure it with disinfectants and all of that. View this the same as the flu. It's going to disappear one day. It's like a miracle. I do think that disinfectant on the hands could have a very good effect. There were people who absolutely believed him, and many of them did not get into the habits of trying to protect themselves and their families for much too long. And it is just now uh, that we have most of the members of Congress all wearing the mask, but there were many of them on the opposite side of the aisle, for sure, that didn't put on a mask for a long time. Well, what does it say to you? I mean, uh, uh, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris's victory was significant, and at a national level, looks like it'll be six million votes. But you and I know that across two or three states, the difference was less than 100,000 votes combined. So it easily could have gone the other way out of 150 million plus votes. What does that say to you that that many of your fellow Americans saw the struggles with COVID, saw a number of other things, and still ultimately said four more years with the 45th commander in chief? It's hard to digest, uh, but what we learned was uh, that racism runs deep and character really doesn't mean much to so many people who would allow uh, the president of the United States to define himself in ways that he's done and still follow him. If everyone were to say, uh, we appreciate what America's done in the first 250 years, but it's time to reset America and reimagine the American experiment, what would be something on your list? What, what would you recommend? What would be one of the ideas that you'd want to be at the center of this bold new experiment? that we're gonna call America 2.0? It would be to allevi alleviate poverty, period. Alleviate poverty, not only in this country, but in this world. I would want no child to be hungry. I would want no family to be without. Every day, lines around the corner at every local food bank in the nation's capital. I would not want there to be the great gap and distance in wealth. To tell you the truth, as chair of the Financial Services Committee, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And when I talk about the elimination of poverty and I talk about the wealth gap, a lot of it has to do uh, with the way that this country has evolved uh, in terms of the haves and the have-nots and the role that Wall Street has played in that and continues to play. So I have a lot of work to do. If you don't mind me taking you back, Congresswoman Waters, because I think so many people know you well, admire you, appreciate you, but I'm not sure everybody knows your backstory. And I'm always curious about how people got on the road to where they were. And I think particularly for a lot of our younger viewers, it can be quite not just inspirational, but educational. How did you come to be involved in politics? Was that a given? Do you come from a long line of politicos or, or did you break some new ground? It's interesting when you ask that I come from a long line of politicals. In a way, I did, but not formalized or organized politics. My mother had opinions, and she talked about them all the time, and not in a very sophisticated way, but she knew what was going on, and she knew who her local elected officials were. We were poor, so she talked about who was good and who was bad, and who was helpful, and what they stood for and you know, how they treated the people. And she talked about presidential candidates. I'll never forget, my mother was uh, basically a Democrat, but she supported Eisenhower. And why did she do that? She, he was gonna bring our boys home from war. I mean, she talked about these things. And so, uh, you know, it was a part of kind of a, 
the conversations that went on with her girlfriends and with us, you know, uh, but it was not about, you know, voter suppression, even voter registration, as we talk about it now. You know, she was a voter. She always voted, but never a lot of talk about other people, you know, who perhaps did not vote. And so how did, what was your big break in getting into politics? Because, you know, someone can want to be involved in politics, but, but to run, to win, to become a member of Congress, to become chair of arguably one of the two or three most important committees rarely happens. As you look back over it, what was your big break? What did you do right that allowed you to end up on that unusual path? One of the uh, defining moments in my life was the war on poverty. Uh, that was started by the federal government. And that war on poverty created any number of programs, including Head Start. And they had programs where they worked with elected officials and helped to place young people as interns in their office. So we wanted to get into Head Start. And I applied and I got hired. And when I did that, I went back to school and I worked and went to school at the same time and got my undergraduate degree and in doing all of this, I moved up in Head Start and I became the supervisor of volunteers and parents. And I helped to develop parent programs. And I helped to help parents get in touch with being in control of their children's destiny, going up to the schools, getting involved in PTAs and all of that. And that brought me in contact with a lot more people and with politicians. And I began to understand the difference in politicians. And so I started to volunteer in political campaigns. And in doing this, the women's movement was really getting started. And you were hearing about women running for office. And so we got together and we went to uh, then, I think it was the Secretary of State who was a woman at the time in the state of California. And she was able to force the election to be opened up for five more days. And I registered for that election. And in those five days that we did it, we were working against organized labor. We were working against the business community. We were working against men for the most part, but that's how we did it. A group of women just had the uh, belief that we could do it, uh, despite the fact that we were not you know, really well connected. And even the elected official that I went to work for was not really, you know, believing that we could do it. Tom Bradley was the mayor at the time. He did not support me, but I got his wife, Ethel Bradley, uh, to support me. And so uh, we put it together and we made it work. And that's how I became an elected official. If you were giving a young Maxine or a young person one piece of advice on love, what would be that piece of advice on love? My advice is you've got to know who you are and whom you are. And when you do that, then you understand what love is and what it is not. As a matter of fact, I often, you know, am amused at the way people throw the word love around and talk about, you know, uh, love you, uh, just love him. You know what I mean? I don't see love quite that way. I see it as much deeper, a much more, uh, of a commitment uh, in terms of how you feel about others and what you're willing to do uh, because you love them. Congresswoman, um, if I may, I want to hit you with four or five quick names of people, ideas, things, and I'd love to get your quick reaction to these if you don't mind. Well, okay. Who is the most talented politician you've ever met? There are actually two. Bill Clinton is the smartest, most effective politician uh, that ever, you know, sought the presidency. And I think that Jesse Jackson is the most inspirational man that I ever worked with. And I spent eight years on two of his campaigns, traveling the country with him. And he was magic in terms of how he was able to inspire and motivate. Biggest mistake you've ever made or one of the biggest mistakes you've ever made? The biggest mistake I have is I've never had a real uh, mentor. I never really had anybody that was really guiding me and said, well, maybe uh, you shouldn't do it quite like that. You know, and let me tell you the consequences of what you're about to do. And so oftentimes um, I have plunged into things uh, 
without the benefit of advice or counsel. What's your karaoke song? What song do you love to sing in the shower, in front of friends? What's your karaoke song? I don't know if I have just one, but uh, I am a lover of Sarah Vaughn, and I love everything that she sings. I listen almost every night to Bring in the Clowns. That is one of the most precious songs that's ever been sung by anybody. But everything that she sings over the rainbow. Over the rainbow. I love it. And I do hum over the rainbow. I've been doing that for years and those kinds of songs. Well, I, I thank you. Bless you. I hope you remain uh, safe and healthy and careful. And I'm excited that you're headed back to Washington. And um, I'm, you know, I'm an optimistic soul. So I'm hoping that uh, the best is yet to come. Well, thank you. Will there are a few of us here who work very hard at uh, helping to create change and new possibilities. So thank you for your thoughts and your best wishes. And uh, I will continue to do everything that I can uh, to make this a better place for us all. Hey, I hope you enjoyed uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. It was my first time meeting her, but I hope not the last. Uh, I loved her intelligence. I loved her fire, her heart. You know, clearly how she got into the game, she's still there today, wanting to end poverty, wanting to make a big difference. I loved and felt that. The wisdom around love, uh, she's as special as my mom said she was, and uh, I'm really glad I got a chance to meet her. I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you haven't already done it, think about subscribing. You can enjoy the show every day. If you haven't tried our podcast yet, consider giving it a try. Sometimes we go a little bit longer there. It's got some extra magic.